speaker this morning, we have with us, we are fortunate to have with us, Mr. Shane D. Kleinman, who is a noted author, lecturer, and the founder of the Russian Toll Club. Please join me in welcoming her, and I'm sure we will enjoy hearing what she has to say about this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I've been to places over the Atlantic Ocean and in the States. I never in 47 and a half years of being in this world experienced what I experienced here today. It's interesting because some folks kept telling me, come for Hallel. You have to get over from Brooklyn and the traffic and I have to get the kids to day camp. But I'm so glad there was no traffic and I made it here in time for Hallel. It was the most inspiring Hallel of my life. And I venture to say that it's possible that I gave up my summer job of 22 years. I'll tell you in a minute because Rebs if you asked me to give you a little bio. So I think perhaps I gave up that job that I was loyally and passionately doing for 22 years so I can experience this moving moment with such beautiful people here in Lawrence, New York. Because had I kept that job, there is no chance that I would have been here this morning. I gave up my lifeguarding job. I was a head lifeguard yeah. for 22 summers in a very big bungalow colony. And uh, my kids needed it. You know, Brooklyn in the summer, you know what it's like. So since I'm an experienced lifeguard, I'm a WSI, I'm a lifeguarding instructor, I love swimming, I love the pool. It was just a natural thing for me to do when I started having my kids. And I raised my 10 kids ages 10 to 40, to 10 to 27 in this bungalow colony. Last summer I decided to give up the job because I'm doing life-saving work, as in counseling, teens at risk and Sean Weiss counseling. So it proved to be impossible to do both. And I also wanted to launch a project I call Project Key, Kedushas Ein Yisrael Key, which is a combination of Simcha and Sneus ideas. And I knew that the job I do in the summer 24-6 would not allow me to go around to colonies and camps and present this project. So I'm thinking that maybe an additional reason for giving up the job was be having the privilege of being here today. My children have a most wonderful Rebbe in Camp Silver Lake in the mountains. He's also a Rebbe Yeshiva Torah Tanima. Four of my boys had him. And he told this story in the nine days. He said, my Anakal, my grandson, came into my bungalow and he said, Zaydi, your roof is leaking, your floor in the kitchen is ripped, this bungalow is in shambles. Zaydi, I am going to build you a new home. And then Rabbi Landau said, and we have to say, Tata, your house is in shambles, burnt and destroyed. We are going to build you a new home. Maybe through the ideas of Tzniyus and Simcha, two essential mitos, characteristics of a Jewish woman, we can build our homes, injecting Kedusha and holiness within its walls, and in this way, build the Beis HaMikdash. I teach in four schools, and in one of the schools, part-time, and in one of the schools, which is a Sephardi, a Syrian Kirov seminary, I, one of the ways that I bond with my students is by baking for them. I bake every week, I bake with my kids, I make different things, and usually the week of Rosh Chodesh, or when I'm in the mood, or when I have extra, I bring in something for my students. Cupcakes, ragala, cookies, what have you. And they love my home-baked stuff. And one Rosh Chodesh, I brought in this delicious oatmeal chocolate chip cookie. It's a Debbie Fields recipe. If you'd like the recipe, my phone number is 718-435-4077. Feel free to call. And I gave them the cookies and I gave them the recipe. The next week a student comes back. I teach there once a week on Wednesdays and she says, Mrs. Kleinman, this recipe is a disaster. I tried it and the batter was running all over the cookie sheet. Not a single cookie would hold together. It was like farina. I don't know what's wrong. 
I said, come here, Rachel. Let me see what you wrote down. Maybe I made a mistake. She hesitated and then she said, um, my mother said we hate oatmeal in this house, so I left out the two and a half cups of old-fashioned oats. Thank you so much. You left out the ingredient that gives the cookie its structure. And we can say, you left out the simcha, you left out a very important ingredient in the recipe. You left out the tzniyus, even if you have the tefillah and the chesed and other things. But if you leave out the tzniyus, you left out a very essential ingredient in the recipe. Let's evaluate our priorities in these areas of simcha and tzniyus and see what our approach should be. I learned the hard way about priorities. This story happened 23 summers ago. I was not working that summer. It was the summer before I took that lifeguarding job. My husband was working that summer. He took a job in a camp, in a boys camp. And I went up to the mountains with my three-year-old daughter, my two-year-old son, and one on the way. And I was wondering when I arrived, what am I going to do this summer? How am I going to occupy myself? There was only one hour of swimming in the morning because it was a boys camp. And my three-year-old was in day camp. My two-year-old was a feisty independent kid who liked to be on his own most of the time. And how am I going to make it a productive summer? Yeah, I like to read, but read a whole summer. And I'm going to sit around in those bungalow colony circles. You know, they sit around and chat and chat and chat some more. I'm not really the type to do that. But then again, I'm not going to hibernate in my bungalow either, isolated. So I found myself in that circle chatting with the women with a break for breakfast, lunch, and supper, which was handed on a, on a golden platter because all the people who worked the staff got all the meals and refreshments and Shabbos, so there's no cooking either. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is how I'm going to spend my summer. One day in the first week of the summer, a knitting, a yarn truck arrived selling yarns and needlepoint, different stuff, crafts. And she had her megaphone as she walked around. The knitting truck is here. The yarn truck is here. I have nothing to do with that. I'm just, you know, not paying attention. And my neighbor asked me, do you know how to knit? I said, no, not my type. She said, you want to learn? I said, okay, you know, I have nothing to do, why not? What am I gonna make? She said, how about a gartel? You know, men, Hasidish men wear gartels on on, when they pray and also on Shabbos. So you wanna make a, a homemade, handmade gartel for your husband? I said, yeah, why not? If you teach me, I'll make it. So she taught me how to knit and purl, very simple stitches, and I got the yarn, and I tell you, I got busy with this project to the detriment of everything else. I was day and night knitting away, and a few days later, maybe a week later, she arrived, and she's here to replenish everybody's yarn and gub line and stuff. And I'm up to the fringes already. And I thought, okay, I'm done with this project. And this neighbor turns to me and she says, you wanna make something else? I said, I didn't think I was going to be uh, subjected to a career of knitting here. And I didn't like the fact that I was so preoccupied either. I was happy to get done with it. And she said, we're going. She didn't even ask me. She just told me, we're going to knit a dress for Leia. And she designed this multicolored yarn in you know, pink and stuff for the bodice and solid pink for the skirt with matching cap sleeves and little socks. I said, I can't do this. She says, I'll put all the parts together. I have a pattern for you. You just knit and purl just like the gartel and I'll put the whole thing together for you. Okay, I have nothing else to do anyway. Way, so I got busy with this project. I tell you, if I was busy with the gartel, I was obsessed with this dress. In fact, while I was swimming, people do different things while they're doing laps. Some people talk to Hashem, some people prepare dinner in their heads, and I was, while I was doing the stroke, I wish I could teach you the correct stroke for those of you who don't know how to swim, my passion for swimming still remains, I was knitting while I was swimming. It was day and night eating, breathing this dress. I'm in the middle of the line, and Yitzchak comes by, the two-year-old. He was recently trained, he's a shvua's baby, and he has to go to the bathroom. And I'm looking at him like, like I'm in the middle of the line, like how could you ask? Remember, this was a preoccupation. And I said to him, go alone to the bungalow, I'll come soon to check on you and take care of you, whatever that means, wash his hands, say asher yatsa, whatever. And I sent him off. I continued knitting. Perhaps a half an hour elapsed, and I suddenly realized with a start, I didn't see that little feller for a long time. I dropped that dress on an oversized chair near me. I didn't care if the whole thing unraveled, and I ran to my bungalow. 
The sight that I beheld is etched in my memory forever. The bathroom door was open. The medicine cabinet was open. There was a bottle of extra strength Tylenol open, its contents strewn on the floor. And Yitzchak was lying prone on a chair that he had schlepped to the medicine cabinet, his stomach on the chair, his head hanging down on one side, his legs dangling down on the other side, utterly motionless. First day teacher, I pick him up, poisoning victim. I yell, I say his name, I try to stir him awake. No response. I cannot wake up this guy. I said, what do I do now? This stupid dress that I'm busy with? I really, I wanted to give it up forever. And I figure, I know what to do. There's a doctor on the premises, boys camp, Bubbiv. I was in, somebody said it was the, is the, is the, is the, is the, the Bubbiv Rebbe? It was in the boys camp, the Bubbiv the boys camp. And Dr. Bullmash was on the premises. And I ran out with my poison victim in my arms to see the doctor. And I bump into this neighbor, the kind one who taught me how to knit, the culprit. And the word starts spilling out of my mouth. Now he got poisoned and I'm running to the doctor and the dress. I don't know if I said that, but I thought it. And she said, calm down. Which kid would eat extra strength Tylenol? It tastes like chalk. When did you buy it? She starts interrogating me while my kid is perishing over here. I said, we bought it two days ago. My son had a headache. My husband had a headache. She said, we're going back to count. She made me come back into the bungalow. She got it on her hands and knees and she started counting the tablets and she came up with 97 and a half tablets in a bottle of 100. Two my husband had taken two days earlier. One he tasted, it wasn't good. He spit out the rest. And then he nicely ensconced himself for his afternoon nap on the nearest surface because his mother mother was too busy with her project to take care of the toddler. So he was not a poison victim. He was a sleeping child. And I put him into bed and he slept for another two hours and he has no recollection whatsoever of this incident. But of my 10 kids, he was the hardest one to wake up every morning. So already in, you know, in his early youth, it was that characteristic already manifested itself that it was hard to wake up this guy. This was a catalyst in my life. For future um, opportunities, when I felt, what are my priorities now? In 1987, Rabbi Hiller from Benos Beis Yaakov invited me to come and be a principal in the school. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, I can't, I'm raising my kids now. I never ended up in Benos Beis Yaakov, but my daughter actually teaches there. She's a fourth grade teacher, an English teacher, Ms. Klein. And, in Benos Beis Yaakov, so if anybody has children there, that's my connection to your community. This community sends there too, right? Okay, so there were, many, there were many different opportunities I had where I said, no, I'm raising my children right now. And in the same way, in every area of our lives, we always have to evaluate what is my priority right now. For many of you coming here today and being part of this Hallel and this beautiful group was a priority and we always have to make the right decisions. So what is our priority in Sneas? We'll get to Simcha also. Our priority in Sneas, and by the way, if you want to see the dress, one day, the, I don't know, a week before Pesach or two, I was cleaning out. You know when you're like cleaning everything out? And this dress was worn by my daughter the next year. And then I had three boys, and then the next daughter wore it. And then I had two boys, and I said, even if I have another girl, um, I don't think she's going to, the dress is old fashioned already. And I, and I just gave it away in a bag of clothes. But I do have a picture, so I'll pass the picture around. I can't believe I actually finished this dress, made this dress. I'll pass it around. Please make sure it comes back to me because it's the only picture I have. So please make sure you pass it down. I'm going to pass it around and you can see the picture while I continue. Okay. Priority in Sneos has to be simply halacha. And halacha crosses all levels of orientation. Wherever you live, in any community, halacha applies the same way. Basically, and that is inviolate. Basically, halacha is that we cannot wear tight or revealing clothes. We have to wear kosher necklines. And we cannot expose our knees and torso and elbows. That's basically halacha. And that applies across the board. And that's a priority. Then we have midos hatsnius. And this applies in different communities differently depending on Minagam Makom. It's Hashkafa. It's a different category. There's more flexibility. And people can grow in different ways. There's more leniency. In some places, like let's say the Sephardi school where I teach, some of them elevate themselves by not wearing their hair down till here. When they start growing in various levels of religiosity, they'll cut their hair shorter. In a Hasidish school where I teach, their elevation is to cover their shaito with a hat. Every place has different minhagim and different hashkafos. In one place, they say bubble skirts. Mm, 
not so, not such a refined garment. Cute story about bubble skirts. Somebody called a rub, a local rub, I don't know which community, to ask him if he could wear a bubble skirt. He says, what's a bubble skirt? I know bubble gum. He calls his wife, rabbit sale, what's a bubble skirt? She says, Fagala, bring down your bubble skirt. <laughs> so, okay, there's the rabbi's daughter wearing the bubble skirt. But depending on where you go, people have different <laughs> sheet toes on accessories, how open the shoes could be. So there's flexibility there. I think that this siddur reflects on that category. My daughter got this siddur from her grandmother, from my mother, for Hanukkah. It has everything in it. It's a beautiful, holy siddur. But it has a very flashy cover. Of course, I'll be how lucky you could da daven in it. And it's actually very lovely for a kid to daven from. It's colorful, it's attractive. But I think that it reflects on the idea I want to bring out. The interior of this siddur is saturated with holiness. So why is it sporting such a flashy exterior? In the same way, we have a very holy interior. Why should we be uh, sporting a flashy exterior? Let's say somebody wants to be dressed in vogue. No problem. You could be in style as long as it's attractive and not attracting. Then it's okay if it's, keep, it's in keeping with halacha. Rabbi Fal, who wrote the monumental Sefer Oz Vahadr Levusha on Tzniyaz, writes that it's fine to wear the styles if it's Tzniyaz dig, if Alpi Halacha, it's not immodest, but maybe we shouldn't be the first ones who wear it. Like, wait until it's entrenched already in your community, because at the beginning it attracts attention. But if by its very nature it's not Pritzas dig, there's no reason why not to wear it. But he does say that you shouldn't be the first one to wear it. So wearing clothes that are in style is okay. But let's be careful not to make fashion the top priority in our lives. It's a problem when the whole emphasis and concentration is on materialism. My mother-in-law works in an upscale children's store in Borough Park, and she tells me about her different experiences with customers. So she said somebody came in, she's looking for three matching outfits for her three girls, and she found them in the right sizes, all the same. She says, are you getting anything else in? Anything else, any shipments coming in? She says, my mother-in-law says, yes, in seven or 10 days we're getting a new shipment. She says, can I take these now? And if that comes in later and I like that better, can I exchange it? So she says, no, because we have a policy that's just a three-day exchange policy. She says, so what should I do now? If I take these and then in 10 days the other shipment ha is nicer and I can't exchange it, then I'm stuck with the one that's not so pretty. And if I leave it here and I come back in 10 days and it's not even nicer, maybe they won't have all the matching anymore. What am I supposed to do? She was so disappointed and upset and perplexed. Says, okay, I'm going to call my sisters. She comes back with two sisters and a friend in tow, and the three of the four of them are huddled together with the, with the you know convention style, trying to figure out what to do. Should we take it now? Should we take it later? The problem is when your whole head is in the clothes. Like somebody once went to a rabbi and he asked them a whole bunch of questions about his galoshes business. You know what galoshes are? Like rain boots. And he was, he wanted you know he wanted to make a good living. And the rabbi has you know a special channel. So he was asking him a whole bunch of questions. So the rabbi said, I already saw feet in galoshes. I never saw the head in galoshes. So it's okay to be in style, but it shouldn't be your, don't be preoccupied with it. And insight from Rav Dessler can help us focus on more spiritual goals. He writes that when you come to the other world, you will retain your basic characteristics. In other words, the mythos that you worked on, you will come along with it and they will stay for eternity. He gives examples. Let's say if you were a materialistic person, when you come to the other world, you will retain that trait. Hey, there are no malls, there are no shopping experiences in the other world, but you're gonna have a yearning, a craving to shop because you were preoccupied with that. That's a kind of hell. You know, we, we, we were raised thinking hell is, you're gonna burn, like in one of the wax museums that my school made, and this was a Tzniyas related one, they're into the thickness of the stockings in that particular school. So they had a girl, they, de they, they uh, demonstrated a pair of stockings that was too thin, you know, it was only, I don't know, 20, 30 denier. And it, well, there were flames licking the, the feet of the person. And their perception of Gehenim is burning physical flesh. 
I like Rav Dessler's way of seeing it. His perspective on it is it's a spiritual kind of Gehenna where you're yearning for something that doesn't exist and you need it because you're so used to it. The other example he gives is of gratitude. If you're not grateful, then when you come to the other world, you're going to retain that attitude of ingratitude and you're going to be in Ilama Emes where you're going to know that you got more than you deserve and you should be grateful, but you will not be able to experience gratitude. <laughs> that is pain for the soul. When we focus on that, we can pursue more spiritual goals as opposed to materialistic goals. In the Sefer Bill, Vavi Mishkanev, the author writes that Dveikos, connection to Hashem, can only be experienced in two worlds or no worlds. If you don't have Dveikos here, you're not going to come to the other world and suddenly be connected to Hashem. If you have it here, you'll have it there. So that's what we need to be working on. Similarly, working on Simcha is not just for the here and now. If we develop Simcha in this world, it will accompany us in the other world. If we don't consciously focus on developing Simcha, it's going to remain a theoretical value. Like, oh, how lovely it is to be Simcha, but it's not going to be practically manifested. So we need to take practical steps to manifest our simcha. Some of those steps are, motions of simcha are smiling, greeting people, thinking positive thoughts, davening for simcha. Those are some of the things we could do to get into the habit of being the simcha. Otherwise, if we don't practice it, it's going to remain theoretical. I want to illustrate with a story. A philosopher was once being driven down the river by a boatman, and the two struck up a conversation. And the philosopher asks the boatman, do you know any literature? Guy looks at him, Greek to me. He says, no, I don't. He says, ah, you lost the third of your life. They travel a distance onward, and again, the philosopher pipes up, do you know any philosophy? His eyes gleaming over the thought. And the boatman says, no, what's that? I don't. He said, ah, you lost two thirds of your life. No sooner did he utter those words and the boat hit a rock and started sinking. Now it was the boatman's turn to speak and he asked the philosopher, do you know how to swim? And he responded frantically, no, I don't. He said, well, you lost your entire life. <laughs> to a man in a sinking boat, theories, philosophies, literature are of no value. Either you know how to swim or you're underwater. In the same way, in a crisis down here when kids are pressing our buttons and our husbands are annoying us or the myriad things that happen in a given day that can annoy us, either we have the practical skills to stay above water or we feel we're submerging and drowning. So we have to actually go through the motions. Ramchal teaches us that an outer enthusiasm becomes an inner reality. So if you just go through the motions on the outside, being friendly, smiling, thinking positive, it will have an effect on the rest of you. The Baal Tanya says, Hergel na A habit becomes second nature. So even if you weren't born like this, if you keep practicing it, it will become your reality. Like they say in English, Fake it till you make it. And Rabbi Miller used to say with Simcha, act as if. So don't worry that you're being dishonest about being the Simcha because you don't really feel it inside. Just go through, go through the motions. We have to raise our level of Simcha from the superficial juvenile level to real Simcha. Some people think they're still trapped as old as they are. They're trapped on a juvenile level. They think Simcha <laughs> means I have what I want. I went shopping. I had fun. They connect simcha to physical manifestations that make them happy. Those are very short-lived. They don't have enduring value. The only simcha that has enduring value, which is why we are allowed to be besimcha and chodesh av, and we could talk about simcha and chodesh av, because that kind of simcha Hashem wants all the time, which is the sipuk hanefesh, in the words of the Rambam, that's avodas Hashem. If you serve Hashem with joy and you have a nachas ruach from making Hashem happy by doing his mitzvot, that is true and enduring simcha. We can elevate our simcha through hakaras hatov, by feeling grateful, recognizing gratitude, and expressing gratitude to Hashem. That adds a lot to simcha. One day, a couple of my students bought me the thank you book by Rabbi Pliskin, and it was at the Shabbos table that I was reading it, and the kids had already benched, they were already hanging around in the family room, and I was still stuck at the table reading. And then I read a, a paragraph he writes that in one of his workshops, he he told people to say, I am grateful to my creator for five minutes in a row every day. And I thought, okay, I'm an open-minded person. I'll try that. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, I'm grateful to my creator. I am grateful to my creator. I am grateful to my creator. I am grateful to my creator. I'm grateful to my creator. I am grateful to my creator. I'm sitting. I am grateful to my creator. I'm grateful. 
This is very mundane and tedious. It is not working at all. I don't see that I'm spreading any joy or gratitude. I chuck it. It's not working for me. And I read on. And I see in the next paragraph, one of the workshop participants said, I couldn't do that, but I decided if I affix those words to my favorite tune, like the beautiful tunes we sang so mellifluously here today, I could do that for five minutes. Now, I like to sing, and I think I could do that. And I see that although earlier, when I was saying it in a tedious, mundane, boring way, my kids were ignoring me when I was singing and dancing it, they all came around like, what's mommy up to now? And they started joining me and they started engaging in antics and singing along. And then I realized what a karasatov has to look like. It has to be oozing from you. You have to be singing and dancing your gratitude. If it's just modem and like what else is new today, without thinking about it, without experiencing it, without expressing it, it's not real hakar satov. It has to be absolutely pouring forth. If you have that kind of hakar satov, it'll elevate your simcha. One summer, I went to give I, I went to give a speech in one of my daughter's camps, and I spoke about simcha and gratitude, and I did this little shtickle also. And at the end of my speech, oh, and I said to the girls, I'd rather my kids think I am crazy glad that I'm so happy and so grateful that I'm singing and dancing my gratitude rather than they should think I am crazy mad. I am giving pitch. I am screaming. I can't handle it. I'm nervous. Better crazy glad than crazy mad. My daughter comes over to me after the speech. She was 16. And she said, this daughter who teaches in Bedell Space Yago, she's my type. And she says, Mommy, your speech was great. We loved it. But just one thing. Why do the girls have to think you're, and she shuts down. I say crazy all together. She says, mm-hmm. I said, oh boy, like feigning disappointment, like poor kid is in camp and the kids think her mother's crazy. So I said, oh boy, what are we going to do about that? She says, Mommy, just keep singing and dancing. I am telling you, crazy glad is a good kind of crazy. We, if we, we, and you know what the beauty of simcha is? That it is equal opportunity simcha. Simcha ha mitzvos, everyone can engage in. It's not, it's not dependent on wealth, brains, beauty, popularity. Everybody can take the mitzvos of the day, whether it's davening or whatever we do, chesed, the everyday things that we do in Yiddishkeit, and and serve Hashem with joy. <clears throat> Several de uh, centuries ago, uh, no, decades ago, let's call it generations ago, there was a fellow in Russia, his, they called him Rabbi Yisrael de Freilacha. Freilacha means happy one. And the reason they called him that way was because he used to be seen singing and dancing in the streets. When people asked him why he do that, he said, because if me, Yisrael the garnish, the nobody, could serve the omnipotent, omnipresent, God, through mitzvot, how could I not dance? This, these, these people in his town gave him a label. They identified him as a happy person. The beauty is that we can also take upon ourselves that identity, and it works. As the Bartanura says, we're all reading Perkei Avos now, in, in Perak Aleph Mishnah Gimel, there's a, a, a a, a, a mission that everybody that people are familiar with. Al tiyu kavadim hamsham shnes harav al menas lekabel pras ella havu kavadim hamsham shnes harav shelo al menas lekabel pras vehim or shemayim aleichem. Be not like one who serves his master for the sake of reward. Be like one who serves his master not for reward. And may the fear of heaven be upon you. So the Bartanura expounds on this. He explains that the whole first part of the mission teaches us that we should serve Hashem mitoch ahava. And, and the last few words, Vehim Arushmaim Aleichem, teaches us to serve Hashem Itoch Yira, and the two together form complete a uh, total avodah. Then he adds these words. Avod miahava, she'im basalus no, da shata ohei, ve'ein ohei sone, serve Hashem with love, because if you come to a point of hatred, you'll know that you're a lover. And one who loves does not hate. Avod miyera, serve out of fear. Sheimba sal live out. If you'll come to a point of kicking, da shatayare. 
the aim yare boate. Know that you're one who fears, and one who fears does not kick. This is an intellectually empowering message on identity. If you tell yourself, I am a happy person, and you internalize that identity when you engage in not I'm sorry, not happy, a, a, a loving person. When you engage in hating type behavior, you'll know that doesn't fit your profile. The same way with simcha. If you decide that you are a happy person, when you engage in sadness or anxiety or nervousness, you will know that does not go together with your identity. Once I was on a plane with my husband and they called out, is there a doctor or EMT on board? So my husband asks me, do you consider yourself an EMT? I said, I can't. I never took the license. You know, he thinks lifeguard instructor, WSI, same thing. I said, I never, I never took the license. I can't take myself, take upon myself the identity of an EMT if I didn't take the 70 hour course. But Simcha, anybody can decide. I identify myself as a happy person and that absolutely can have an effect on you. Just want to add another few ideas on identity. I read in a Kashrus magazine about a Baal Shuva who we came from, but she had one weakness. She loved all kinds of shellfish. And she was afraid that when she's going to go on a trip to the supermarket, she will not be able to overcome her desire for crabs. And she's going to succumb to buying, you know, lobster, shrimp, what have you. So she made herself a badge that reads, I keep kosher. And so armed, she went to shop. It doesn't make sense that she's proclaiming for all the world to hear, I keep kosher, and then pick up a few crabs. Like you see the girls wearing, don't even think of telling me Lush and Hara. On those, day, on those days, you know, you better not start off with them because today they're Lush and Hara free. That's the power of identity. Same way, you wake up in the morning and you say, I am a snua. The way you dress, the way you go shopping will reflect that identity. One more story on, on identity. When my daughter, my oldest daughter was 11 years old, 16 years ago, she had a friend over and they were playing in her room. I don't know what Leia did. She's the little girl in the picture. I hope it comes back. She, I hear her friend saying, Leia, your mother's going to yell at you. And Leia's response was music to my ears. It's not even true, but it left me suspended in the kitchen thinking, I love that, I love that, that's my identity. She said, my mother doesn't yell. Thousands of times in my parenting career, I've played that over in my head. I want to hold on to that identity for dear life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ruin it by shrieking. And as I said, it wasn't even true. But the label, because of course, you know, you raise your voice here and there. Maybe the, over, the overwhelming feeling was that I don't yell. But I, I wanted to hold on to that, and that's the power of identity. As we work on Simcha, and we gain greater awareness of its power and influence, we can apply some of it to the awesome mitzvah of Tzniyus. One very easy way to earn Hashem's protection without totally transforming ourselves, because that's what happens when you learn about Tzniyus. You say, oh, I don't want to change. I like the way I am. Like, don't impose on me. I don't want to change. So I want to give you an easy solution that you don't really have to change, and that is to be more careful. However you dress now, if you just add that point, being more careful, it will make a difference in, in what kind of identity you have. A snua, by definition, is careful. She's careful with what she's wearing, how she's sitting, what she's saying, how she's saying it, to make sure that it befits a basti straw. I want to share a few observations that prove that it's all, that very often it's all about being careful. I was in a mall, and I saw a woman remove her jacket. She was crouching under the racks, she obviously was in a rush, and she was crouching under the racks, removed her jacket, she was wearing a sleeveless vest underneath, and put on another jacket that she wanted to buy. She doesn't think anybody saw her. How do I know the details so intimately? Because it was me. I was in a rush to get home, get the preschoolers off the bus, and the fitting room was, you know, somewhere all the way in the back, the undressing rooms, however they call it today, and I knew I didn't have time, and I wanted that jacket. It was a good teaching jacket, and it was well-priced, and I wanted it, and I didn't have time, so I did that. I looked around. There was nobody around. I crouched beneath the racks. I took off my jacket, put the other one on, and I ran to the cash register, you know, made a beeline for the highway, and made it in time. I never thought about it. Nobody saw me, but then once I was in ShopRite, and I bought an item that was two for one, and I came home and I see, I looked at my receipt when I got home. It's good to check the receipt before you leave. And I see that they charged me for three. Buy one, get one free. Buy one, full price, no get one free. I'm not an idiot. When I buy two for one, I buy both. 
So there's no way I'm taking either two or four or six, and I know I only took two, and I had the shopping carriage, you know, the stuff to prove it. But how am I going to prove it to them now? It wasn't so much money; it was like six ninety nine or something. But just for fun, I kept the receipt. And when I went back to shop right the next time, I came to the service counter and I told them, "I don't think you could prove this, but I'm just telling you, I'm not an idiot. It's two for one. I took two, and you showed that it's, it's scanned three. She says, "No, we could check that. We have." 24 hour seven cameras running over every register, and we have the receipt. We see the cash register, the cashier, the time, everything. We're going to go to the camera and we're going to review it and see if you do your shopping. Come back in 10, 15 minutes. We'll be able to see. That's interesting, you know, just for the experience. I come back. She says, "Yes, we were able to uh, actually witness that you took only two, and here's your 699 refund on your credit card." And somehow I connected it to that story. Hey, there are cameras in different places recording. Our actions. Who knows who recorded that episode? So if there are cameras down here recording what we do and what we say all over the place, then surely up there in Shemayim, no challenge for them to record everything we wear and everything we say. So we want to be careful. Once I was in a camp. I was walking down the path, and I see a girl. She was dressed very snazzy. She even had her top button closed. Her T-shirt wasn't tied. Her skirt was the right length. Everything was perfect. Then she got hot, or not hot. She got something else. I'll tell you in a second. She proceeded to lift her T-shirt all the way up and started scratching an itch that she had up north here somewhere, completely exposing her torso. She was dressed snazzy. It was about not. Being careful. Somebody told me that she was walking in Bar Park, center of town, 15th Avenue, 49th Street, at 9 p.m., and she saw a lady coming out on her porch wearing a turtleneck and tights, nothing else. And she proceeded to throw her garbage bag over the porch railing to the front yard below. Sometimes an undignified mode of action accompanies an undignified mode of dress. She just wasn't careful. She figured nobody would see her. I call this syndrome when we're not careful all the time the "good for Miami" syndrome. How did I name that? I was once in a dress shop, and they had like this. They had a sale, and they had a rack of. Um, I don't know which kind of、uh, negative adjective to use, but atrocious clothes for seventy percent off. And there's this old lady, senior citizen, perusing the seventy off rack, and she picks up this yellow dress. It was a particularly <coughs> off color, yellow. And she says,、uh, "What do you think of this color?" I said,、um, "You know, trying to be eu euphemistic.、Um, um, I don't know. Maybe you'll get used to it, but I'm concerned about the neckline. It's very." Cut out. How are you going to fix it? She said,、nah, "It's good for Miami." You know, my husband's down in Costa Rica. She's saying it's hot over there. Don't worry. Like it's it's good. It's good for the weather. So that's the good for Miami syndrome. That sometimes we're just not careful. For Miami, it's good enough. We're running out to the、uh, nail salon. So even though we usually wear tights, so now I don't need tights because I'm getting a pet a pedicure. Or、uh, somebody told me that、uh, they went to take a short line bus. These buses that run from the mountains to the city, and there were three girls in their nightgowns, accompanying or pajamas, accompanying their friend who was taking an early morning bus. So their reasoning was like, who's going on the bus at 7:30 in the morning, like an ungodly hour to get on the bus? So like, we're going to get dressed now. The morning we want to head right back for bed. So that's when we are not careful all the time. I'd like to present some specific guidelines that we should be more careful with, and I categorize it by nine S's. The letter S, as in simcha, as a reminder that whatever we do to strengthen sneus, we should do besimcha. Well, we do it besimcha; it's much easier to do. So here are the nine S's. Number one, shells. Shells that are stretched out or scooped low. We should be careful to have the、uh, necks kosher.、Uh, the neck is the the vertical part. Once it starts getting horizontal, that's the shoulder, and that has to be covered. We、uh, once at a Benos Malachim worldwide event, a Litvish girl was heard telling a Hasidish girl when they were talking about necklines, "That's for you guys." In other words, the necklines only apply to Hasidish girls. So I want to say that I found in the market. March 1992 issue of a Jewish Observer, when Reb Moshe Feinstein Zitzal, who was a universal gadol hadar, not Hasidish for sure, was asked how high the neckline of a woman's clothing should be, he answered, "The height where a man wears his shirt with a necktie." Ouch! That's pretty close. I want to recommend to you that if you're wearing a shell that is. Under a jacket or sweater, 
There's a simple way to fix it. This is an amateur way to fix it, but it works if you're wearing a shell under a sweater or under a jacket, which a lot of people wear. Take the label off in the back, because that'll take away bulk. You want to reduce bulk. You go directly to the center, and you cut a little slit in the back. By the way, in many years of doing this, I never ruined anything. Nothing unravels further. Cut it down like about two inches and keep, keep a safety pin in your shells. Oh, like I said, this is an amateur way of doing it, but you could do it professionally. But if you want to just do it the easy way, and then every time you put it on, you just affix the safety pin in the back and it holds for the rest of the day. The problem is that the circumference of the head is wider than the circumference of the neck. And therefore, every time you schlep it on, it gets more and more stretched out. So this is an easy way to fix a shell that you're wearing under a jacket or sweater. Number two, skimpy tops that are revealing or tight fitting, we should avoid. Even Land's End got this right. In one of their catalogs, they're advertising a turtleneck. Our ribbed turtleneck sweater is fully fashioned to fit right, never tight. So we should be careful with skimpy tops. Number three, short skirts. The full spectrum of our gadolim agree that knees have to be covered in all positions. The knees are not hasidish, chumra, it's doraisa to show your knees. So be careful when you, when you buy a skirt, sit down in the store to see if it's gonna cover when you're sitting as well. The universally accepted number of inches is that if you wear skirts that are four inches below the knee, you will have good coverage. You can have good coverage with two or three also, depending on how careful you are, And but don't sit down then, especially if it's a pencil skirt tight. You have to be careful that your knees do not get revealed in any position. Every knee shall bend to you. I noticed that the, that the shorish of knee, berech, and bracha are the same. Maybe if we are careful to cover our knees, we will see bracha in our lives. Number four, snug fitting maternity wear. Throughout history, even in the secular culture, pregnant women try to conceal their ever expanded figures. Now, even in orthodox communities, the most orthodox communities, women are presenting themselves in very revealing clothes in pregnancy. Uh, the proof that it's a world gone fashion insane, regular people, even children, that are not pregnant, wear high-waisted, tunics, maternity-type clothes, while pregnant women wear regular clothes that get snugger and snugger from month to month. Number five, stockings. Stockings is definitely an example of something that has different shitos in different communities. What I venture to suggest is, especially with nude-colored stockings, if you don't wear stockings at all, or you wear them on and off, try to wear stockings every day. And if you do wear stockings or tights, try to increase the denier a little bit if it's very, very see-through. But again, there's, there's different the controversies over it because there are different shitos whether that area is considered part of the thigh. I don't want to go into it, but I'm just suggesting if you don't wear tights, try to wear tights. If you wear tights that's thin, try to wear it a little thicker. Number six, stoops, waiting for buses, potential pitfall of peekaboo, people sitting there, legs apart, butterflies, I see. So be careful how you sit down. Porches also sometimes present a very unattractive view. Number seven, slits are one of the most difficult forms of pretzels. It has a beckoning effect on the one who views it because it's like a neon light. Now I see it, now I don't, I want to see more. So uh, the whole spectrum of gadolim, litfish, yeshivish, sparty, everybody agrees that slits have to be closed, even when wearing it with tights, and even if the whole slit is below the knee, slits have to be closed. It's a difficult one for people who are not used to it, but it is one of the most serious forms of immodesty. Number eight, spirit of tzniyos like very striking colors, very ostentatious clothes or jewelry. People who create the lifestyles today, the, the styles today, have a lifestyle that is slipshod and immoral. Who do you think designs the clothes? People like us who are refined people and have self-respect should feel uncomfortable wearing clothes that are suitable for low lives. I think this idea is reflected in this ad. I actually begged the Amiga in the fruit store to give it to me. It's an advertisement for Del Monte Gold pineapples. And it says it's a beautiful, unblemished pineapple. And it says, inspiring jealousy in pineapples everywhere. <laughs> They're all about flaunting what we have. Show it off more and more. But we 
are a cultured, civilized people. There was a new movie advertised on billboards. It was called Ugly is the New Beautiful. And once I was behind a woman who got a nasty a circular sticker from like a wise potato chip bag on her spiky heels. And as she walked, she tried to remove it. She was like walking in a very funny way. She was trying to get it off without bending down because if she would bend down, her skirt would like plots because it was that tired and short, uh, tight and short. And finally, after a few frustrating attempts, she just picked up her foot and peeled off the sticker. And I was standing right near her, so I read what it said. It read 99 cents. And I was thinking sometimes we wear clothes that look like they cost 99 cents. They don't, but they look, they're such schmatis. They look like that's what they cost. Number nine, sacrifice. Consider whatever you give up because you decided, you know, I want to grow. I want to elevate myself. I don't want to wear that anymore. Consider that whatever you do give up because you don't think it conforms to your a new appreciation for Tzniyas, a sacrifice, a carbon, and do it with Simcha. Today, there's so much awareness and education there's almost no excuse to be learning and growing. There are books that, oh, I forgot the books at home. I, I, want to, I have a friend who authored the book Daughters of Dignity, and it's a beautiful book on Sneas. Uh, her phone number is 436-2360. If anybody wants to get the book, it's like $8, $10, dollars she will send it to you, 436-2360. Uh, that's one of the books. There are other books on Sneas. There's so many ways in which we could be learning and growing. When I was growing up, this saying made the rounds. Rather keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> Today, there's so much education that if you're like under a rock, you're not aware that you should be growing in sneeze. It's like reminiscent of that statement. The key is to do it besimcha with an attitude of I'm in the know, I'm not in the dark. I'm educated, I'm aware, and I'm proud to be a bas melech. In addition to being dignified ourselves in dress, speech, and action, we should also consider whether we could do a little bit of sneers outreach. I like to compare this, I make a parallel between Kirov outreach and sneers outreach. There are quite a number of Kirov professionals in North America, but there are four and a half million lost Jews in North America who are assimilated, who don't know the beauty of Judaism. We cannot leave it up to just the care of professionals to bring people back. We have to reach out, laymen, to acquaintances, friends, people on the block, reach out, show them a Shabbos, teach them about the beauty of Yiddishkeit. In the same way, there are very few Tzniyas professionals. We need everybody on their block, neighbors and friends and family, to reach out and engage in SNES outreach. The fundamental basic approach that SNES outreach has to be positive outreach with an emphasis on unity as a community, on actors, we're all together, we all care about each other. We have to utilize the catch them being good phenomena, which means compliment family and friends when they're wearing something beautiful and modest. Everyone, especially children, will appreciate a compliment. They are dressed beautifully and they are modest. That is the fundamental area in Sneas Outreach. In addition, we can also, when we can, do the mitzvah, reach out to somebody we're close to and make them aware that something privately and, sensit and sensitively with tact, make them aware that something is amiss. In the seminary where I work, where there are many different levels of sniyot, sniyot, and your religiosity, um, I always talk about it and I compliment them. Even if a girl is wearing a slit up the whole way and she's not wearing tights and she's wearing open shoes with blue nail polish on her toes and she has a cut uh, and she has a short skirt. If she's wearing a kosher neckline, I'll compliment the neckline. And they feel very good. They tell me they dress in their most modest clothes on Wednesday. One day one of the girls asked me, Mrs. Kleinman, hi, what's up? I say, your neckline's up. That's what's up. She gives me a big hug. So it's about positive outreach, but at the same time when we have opportunities, we should reach out to show people in our inner circle what might be um, necessary to correct. In Kirov, we never say, God will strike you down if you don't keep Shabbos. You're not afraid? It doesn't work. We open up our homes, we show the beauty of Yiddishkeit. In the same way, Tzniyas cannot be done in a negative way, in a condescending, accusatory, judgmental way. Like, what are you thinking? You're making people sin. That does not work. Rather, promote awareness with positive expectations and respect. I read an article about a Baal Tshuva who went around telling everybody, I became an anical. I became a grandson by number, and everybody just said Mazel tov, by, by guy number 49, 
that he told this good news to, the guy said, you don't say it like that. You say, I had an anical. I became a Zadie. He said, oh, I just told 48 people I became an anical. Like, thank you so much for correcting me. How many times do we have to let it pass that somebody's bending over and her torso is showing and we won't say anything? There's a slogan in New York, 1,944 New Yorkers saw something and said something. So it, all messages in, in the world are messages for Avodah Hashem. So if you see somebody's torso exposed because they're bent over, all they probably have to do is stick the t-shirt in. Why don't you alert them and tell them, by the way, you're probably not aware, but your t-shirt is not tucked into your skirt. Why let another 50 people see that, or especially men? We don't want to do that. Also, when you tell somebody, sometimes you're the second person that said that. One of my friends told me she told somebody, she was doing something very see-through. She didn't see from far, like the entire outline of her undergarment was showing. She says, you're probably not aware, but your shirt is very see-through. She says, oh, you know, you're the second person that told me. My sister also told me, I better, I better do something. It's like with the shidduch. Somebody recommends a shidduch, nah, and then the next person, oh, wow, two people already told me. So sometimes you're the second person, and then you make a difference. Also, we can speak up in stores to ask them to carry what we need. If we do it with a way of hakar satol, Thank you so much for providing services and goods. We're so grateful you're in our community. Is it possible maybe that you can, when you order the next shipment, the skirts could be a little longer because these 22-inch skirts, they're like from midgets. They just, or 19-inch. They're just not good enough for our girls. If you do it in a polite way, it's going to work. I have a Sephardi girl who teaches in one of the most, po who works in one of the most popular stores in Borough Park. I got a text from one of my students. She says, did you see Hannah lately? She put on tights. I'm telling you, she's growing. So right away, I text Hannah and I reveal. I, I forward the text from Janelle to Hannah. She should see, you know, the compliment. So Hannah calls me. She says, Mrs. Kleiman, I'm telling you, next season you'll be able to buy in our store. I said, because sometimes I come in and I can't find anything for my girls. She, I said, oh, great. I'm so excited. Why? She said, because somebody came in after the Benos Malachim Worldwide last year. And she said to her, can I speak to you uh, privately? She's okay. She tells uh, the, the owner. And she says, um, look at this. She's, first she thanked her and complimented her for all the lovely clothes that she sells and providing goods and services. Then she she said, you see these tops? They're, they're made so skimpy. Like, look at this size small. is like for a Barbie doll. Like, these are, our girls are going to be wearing it because they're shopping for camp now. And many of the skirts are very short. It's not, it's not enough. Maybe you can do something about it. And again, I appreciate what you're doing. She was complimenting her. And she says, you know, you're so nice. And we're going to try to do something about it. So my student was telling me, like, they were ordering with a little extra hem length, like two extra inches in the, in the, le in the hems. So this, this is the way of doing it, to do it in a, in a positive, happy way. I want to finish with the story. After the Benos Malachim, that's the newest worldwide event last year, I told the audience that I could get, there were 2,000 people in the audience, and I said I could get up in front of 2,000 people if I dive in passionately for Atzlacha, and I prepared well, and talk about this topic. But if I approach one person and tell them, you're probably not aware, but your knees are showing, maybe you want to uncross your legs, my heart could be pounding in my chest. But I said to the assembled, we have to have courage to speak up in a positive way to help each other grow. Somebody calls me, a stranger calls me after the event and she says, you know what's wrong with you? You don't have enough Ahavas Yisrael. Because if you would have enough Ahavas Yisrael, you would love people so much, you wouldn't have a problem telling them that their needs are uncovered. It's because you have a deficit in Ahavas Yisrael. So I defended myself. I said, no, it's because I have Ahavas Yisrael. Because if I tell 2,000 people to be careful with their knees, I'm just giving education. Everyone can do whatever they want with it. I'm not imposing. I'm not indoctrinating. I'm not making a judgment. But if I tell one person, by the way, your knees are showing, maybe you want to uncross your legs or pull down your skirt, then I am making, it's like a judgment call. I'm telling the person, you know, you didn't dress right this morning. You should have checked. You should have bought something else. That's why my heart is pounding because I don't want to hurt anybody. Just no, you don't get it. It's about, the Ahavis Yisrael is so strong that you love the person so much, you know you're helping them. So I'm an open-minded person. I said, okay, I, I take that. I'll try to develop my Ahavis Yisrael. She calls me up a couple of weeks later. She tells me, I want to tell you a story. I have a therapist, a not yet from therapist for my son. And now that it's summer, it was June, she's coming to my house dressed quite inappropriately. And my mother Mother was over one day and she saw how she's dressed and she said, you have to get rid of her. You can't have her in your home. She said, mommy, give me a day or two. I know what to do. The next day, the therapist arrived. She told me for one whole hour, while the therapist was doing therapy with her son, she was davening to Hashem for Ahavis Yisrael. I love my therapist. I love my therapist. She was just building up a case of Ahavis Yisrael. The lady has OCD legit with Ahavis Yisrael. And after the hour, she said, she bursts out, I love you. You're the best therapist in the world. I wouldn't exchange you for anyone. Is it possible for you now in the summer to come dress more modestly? She said, sure, 
sure. You should have told me right away. And she started coming dressed more modestly. Then I ha. Then I understood what she was telling me that her constructive criticism was really good feedback. That if a Hamas Yisrael is so strong, when you tell a person they know, it's not because it's a holier than thou attitude. It's not because I'm here to repair everybody's mistakes besides my own. It's coming from a love in your heart. Just want to finish with this uh, little visual aid. Imagine, if you will, a big boat, a luxury liner on the seas. One side has a guardrail, the other side does not. On which side do the passengers feel more secure? Where is there more freedom of movement? Obviously, the side with the guardrail. That brings protection and security. It even allows the passengers to come closer to the edge without fear of falling off. In the same way, Sneos is a guardrail of protection. Hashem loves us unconditionally, no matter the level of our Sneos. But if we love ourselves, we will choose the guardrail of modesty and earn Hashem's, earn Hashem's protection. Two years ago, I was invited to speak in England. And on my way home on the seven hour flight, I, I was preparing a speech on Sneos for a seminary. It's a challenging one to do it right. And, one second, did I bring it? Yes, here. And uh, on the way back, I, I figured I want to make it cute. I want to make it with it. I don't want it to be like Yunchi. You know the word Yunchi? Yunchi means like frumpy, frummy kind of speech. That's not going to go over well with the teenagers. So I started writing Tsneos in rhymes. When I got to 26, corresponding to Yud K Vav K, I stopped and thought, if you keep these, you're with Hashem always. Of midriff exposure, there have been reported cases when women with short tops bend down to tie the laces. Crossing your legs often causes exposure of the lower knee. Sit down in front of a mirror and you'll agree. When sitting on a step, stoop, or low step, be wary of the view the passers-by get. Clothing that fits like a glove does not sit well with the one above. Bright, flashy, neon color look attractive on the classroom wall, but not for a basti stroll. Just leave it in the mall. Keep conversations low and discreet when you must be on a cell phone in the street. Cosmetics should enhance your natural beauty. Avoiding excessive application is our moral duty. When purchasing a robe, avoid fabrics that are slinky, clingy, and tight. The outline of the undergarments should be kept out of sight. Skirts that are four inches below the bottom of the knee provide proper coverage to the T. Go shopping with a friend or relative who is sneer so weird. From the wrong selections, you'll surely veer. Avoid an overdosage of perfume that permeates an entire room. Fl uh, flashy, clunky, and unrefined shoes may be okay for Nahrim, not for religious Jews. Lower the sound when men are around. Shells tend to stretch when pulled over the head. Secure it in the back with a safety pin instead. Skin colored shells, oops. From far, it looks like skin, whoops. Consider upgrading denier if stockings are very thin, especially they reveal all the blemishes on your skin. If a garment has a slit, a kick flick will give it a comfortable fit. When running in the street, skirt flapping in the breeze, you may not realize the display of your knees. Refrain from eating in the street and gum chewing outdoors, and the perfect sneeze diet is yours. A dignified basmelech wears clothes that fit right. Avoid those that are revealing, provocative and tight. Wear an extra layer with garments that are see-through. Always check before wearing, preferably when it's brand new. Don't let your elbows peek out from sleeves that are wide-fitting or too short. Perhaps the longer sleeves you wish to resort. Be discriminating when you choose a store to, to patronize. Some of them are totally desensitized. Maternity clothes should not accentuate the expanding form. Let's protect our precious unborn. A lycra shell that is skin tight on the arm is definitely a cause for alarm. An obsession with fashion can sabotage your spirituality. A mindset of histapkus is the Torah mentality. Hope you enjoyed my Tzniyas rhymes. I give out, we live in challenging times. When I finished writing it, I said, Hashem, if it is your divine will that this plane explode and we end up in smithereens in the Atlantic Ocean I accept your divine will but Hashem there is only one copy of these rhymes and with that we safely landed I want to thank you all for being the most wonderful audience starting with Halal and your beautiful faces and Hashem Shalom should be able to spread Simcha in our lives our communities our world thank you very much